Good afternoon. Today's mini -e lecture will describe a study done by Boucher, Monte, and Kovals concerning the question if money has the ability to counteract ego depletion effects. First of all, let us consider how ego depletion effects occur. Ego depletion effects arise from a lack of self-control. Self-control can be defined as the ability to effortfully alter one's own responses. For example, being able to diet because you know that it will help you lose weight in the future. However, it has been discussed that self-control relies on limited resources, such as willpower and strength. This means that when you perform too much self-control on, let's say, task 1, the amount of available resources will be lower on task 2. Let us discuss this further. A study performed by Baumeister and colleagues displays this ego depletion effect. In their study, they showed that when participants in task 1 chose a healthier but less delicious snack, such as carrots, over a more delicious snack, such as chocolate chip cookies, they had lower persistence in solving an unsolvable puzzle in test 2. Where lies the relevance of these ego depletion effects for research? Well, as you can see in this slide, they have the ability to cause multiple negative effects. One of these negative effects is imp impulse buying. Something which is rather interesting when considering consumer behavior. Since all those negative effects that can follow from ego depletion, it is important to research how those can be diminished. From previously done research on money and self-control, it can be derived that money has the ability to enhance self-control. This hypothesis is based on research from Foss and colleagues, and it has shown how money and thinking of money can increase persistence. Persistence is one of the indicators of self-control. This brings us to the following research question. Does the idea of money buffer ego depletion effects? There are two possible results patterns. The first expected result pattern is based on research that has shown how money increases strength and self-sufficiency, regardless of past self-control. Therefore, it hypothesizes that a non-depleted money-primed group shows more self-control than a non-depleted neutral and depleted money-primed group. In this order, these groups score higher on self-control than the depleted neutral prime group. However, research has also shown how money has the ability to serve as a buffer to ego depletion, but does not have the ability to provide extra self-control for non-depleted participants. This brings us to the second possible result pattern that hypothesizes the same amount of self-control for the non-depleted money prime, the non-depleted neutral prime, and the depleted money prime. Following these three groups should show higher self-control than the depleted neutral prime group. The current study used two experiments existing out of two stud studies each. Here you can see a quick overview of what that looked like. Amongst both experiments, participants were randomly assigned into a two, existing out of non-depleted and depleted, by two, existing out of money prime and neutral prime, factorial design. Now let us go into detail. Experiment one, study one. Here the participants were given a difficult to read historical text, consisting of a couple of sentences. They had to cross out every E that they found in the text. 
Then the participants were given a supplementary text with instructions. These instructions dependent on their experimental condition. In the non-depletion condition, participants had to continue to cross out every E. In the depletion condi condition, they couldn't cross out an E if that E was two letters away from another vowel or was next to another vowel. Searching for these E's while fighting the urge to cross out the E in some cases reflected self-control. After five minutes of this task, the participants responded to the manipulation check items, in which they had to report on a scale from one, which meant strongly disagree, to five, which meant strongly agree. The degree of difficulty, how frustrating the task was, and the extent of which they had to fight the urge to cross out wrong E's while doing the task. Whether the participants were reminded of money occurred in the following descrambling task. Participants were given five words for each sentence and asked to use four words to create a meaningful sentence. In the money prime condition, half of the words were money related. For example, one green lottery I became I won the lottery. In a neutral prime condition, these sentences were unrelated to money. For example, I metal wrote letter became I wrote the letter. To check if the concept of money was more accessible amongst money prime participants, another manipulation check was done. It consisted of 20 word stems. Seven of the 30 word stems were able to form a word either related or unrelated to money. For example, CA can be cash or cane. The accessibility of this concept was measured by the amount of money related words that were formed. After that, the participants filled in the PANAS scale, which measures the degree of negative and positive effect. Also can be named as your mood. In experiment one, study two, the participants completed the Stroop task, in which the participants had to say the color of the ink of the word that it was written in. They were asked to do that as quickly as possible. First, they had to read the word that matched the color of the ink. The word blue in blue ink. Then they completed words that did not match the color of the ink. For example, green in the color blue. Here, self-control was required since participants couldn't simply read the word of the color aloud. The time that was needed to complete each set was timed. The time difference between sets contained the measure of self-control performance. Now let us consider experiment two, study one. In study one, participants had to participate in a thought listening task. During this task, they were asked to write down their thoughts on a piece of paper. In the non-depletion condition, participants were given the instructions to think about whatever they liked. In the depletion conditions, participants could think of anything besides a white bear. After this, the participants responded to the manipulation check items which were mentioned before. Then the participants were reminded of money by using the same descrambling task of experiment one. For study two, the participants had five minutes to complete 15 anagrams. The anagrams varied in difficulty, with two four-letter anagrams, six five-letter anagrams, and seven, six, and seven letter anagrams. After this, the participants responded to the manipulation check items 
consisting of the same subjects as mentioned before. Now let us consider the results, starting with experiment 1. As you can see in the following table, there is an interaction between depletion and priming conditions. The main effects of depletion and priming conditions were not significant. In a neutral prime condition, the depleted participants performed worse on the Stroop desk than the non-depleted participants, which is shown in the red circle. Among the depleted participants, the money prime group did better than the neutral prime group, which you can see in the green circle. Let us move on to experiment two. So, in experiment two, there was an interaction between depletion and priming conditions. However, there was no significant main effect. Depleted participants solved fewer than non-depleted ones in a neutral prime condition, which you can see in the red circle. The participants in the money prime condition solved more anagrams than in the neutral prime condition among the depleted participants. This you can see in a green circle. How can we conclude? The results show that there is strong evidence for the hypothesis that the idea of money buffers the ego depletion effects. To explain further, participants who performed large amounts of self-control on the first task were able to maximize their ability for self-control again on the second task. When money was used as an incentive that required that ability. Money primes thus served to reduce the difficulty of a self-controlled task and reduce the effort participants had to exert while completing it. Now, however, the effect was only evident among depleted participants. This means that the money prime did not lead to extra self-control ability among non-depleted participants. This finding is consistent with other research examining interventions for ego depletion effects. The explanation? We have a certain baseline level at which we can apply limited levels of self-control. When participants are not required to use self-control on the first task, non-depleted, they still find themselves on the baseline of self-control before starting task 2, meaning that the availability of self-control is not lowered yet. Therefore, no incentive is required for the participants in order to complete task 2 by the usage of self-control. To conclude, interventions in absence of previous exertion will have no effect. The last part is limitations and possible future research. There are some limitations to these results. First of all, when people were asked about the difficulty and effort of Anagram's task, they had already completed the task. Therefore, it's unclear if performance on the Anagrams did affect the difficulty and effort ratings or if it worked the other way around. Secondly, the causal relationship between money priming, difficulty and effort is ambitious. Did depleted money primed participants find the anagrams less difficult and thus expend less effort? Or did they realize that they were exerting relatively little effort and concluded that the anagrams were not so difficult? Besides that, activating the concept of money, which we call priming, may have operated as a kind of if efficacy manipulation since money can confer feelings of efficacy. 
At last, the found effect of money primes could be limited to self-controlled tasks where there is an objective index of performance, for example, the anagram solutions. It may work differently in other self-controlled tasks, for example, focusing on persistence, implying that there may be other mechanisms present that explain the beneficial effects of money. An interesting direction for future research would be to test whether money priming increases feeling of self-efficacy before completion of the second self-controlled task. Then this brings us to our final slide, our references that were mentioned in this presentation. Thank you for your attention and hopefully you've learned more about how money has the ability to counteract ego depletion effects. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice day. Welcome to this mini e-lecture about a paper that's called Money Cues Increase Agency and Decrease Pro-Sociality Among Children. Almost everyone is familiar with a popular game called Monopoly. The purpose of this game is to buy and invest in streets, houses and hotels to gain money from your opponents. When your opponents are totally broke, you win the game. If you think back about all the games you've played with your family or your friends, you might think about extreme feelings of competition. No wonder some games end in a flip playboard and all the pieces on the ground. But could the behavior of people really change when playing Monopoly? And would the amount of money possessed by the players have influence on their behavior towards another? This question was studied by Paul Pitt. He let a hundred participants play a game of Monopoly with each other. There was, however, one exception to the normal rules. One of the players started with twice as much money, and this player was also allowed to throw two dice instead of one, creating a rich player and a poor player. As the game unfolded, the rich player started to become more rude and less sensitive to the other player. What this result shows is that money can, in fact, have influence on the behavior of humans towards other humans. This paper examined the influence of money on the behavior of children aging from 3 to 6 years old. The behavior of these children can be associated with two different modes communal mode and market mode. In order to fulfill one's needs, people tend to use these different modes when communicating with others. People differentiate in behavior, social roles, mindset and motives when using these two modes. Communal relationships are mostly formed with close social relatives or with people that are close in a person's network. People in these kind of relationships share resources easily with others. However, it is also profitable to share and trade resources with less close relations. In these kind of situations, people tend to use market mode. Especially money cues can trigger behavior in line with market mode, since money is used everywhere over the world and is a strong symbol of the market. People that are being reminded of money improve on motivation and competency tasks. However, previous findings indicate that money weakens pro-social behavior. This might imply that market mode interferes with behavior related to communal mode. The researchers argue this might be the case because communal mode relies on similarities between humans. Market or money, on the other hand, makes the differences between humans extra visible. So, we now know what these two modes mean, that money is associated with market mode and that behavior of market mode might interfere with behavior of communal mode. Previous research has already examined the effect of money cues and showed that adults do in fact show behavior in line with market mode and uh, less communal behavior and primed with money cues. However, these studies focused exclusively on adults who happen to know the value and meaning of money. The current paper adds to this existing knowledge by choosing a sample of children between 3 and 6 years old. 
these children do not yet understand the value and function of money. Therefore, the currently discussed study is very interesting. If this study does find replicate findings to the similar study with adults, it would open pathways to further studies about the influence of money on the behavior of people. This is important because it would show how strongly money is ingrained in our culture and maybe unconsciously in our cognition as well. Also, it would show that the influence of money must not be overestimated. This new knowledge would be important in all kinds of fields because the way humans behave towards another is relevant in all aspects of daily life. This leaves us with the following hypothesis for the experiment. Given that young children are sensitive to key markers of market and communal modes and can alter their behavior accordingly, we predict that money cues would strengthen their market mode behaviors and weaken their communal mode behaviors. This hypothesis was tested by conducting five experiments. Okay, so let's take a look at the first experiment. The question that we want to answer is, does money priming improve effort and performance? The prediction is that exposure to money will provoke market mode behavior in children. In this experiment, 86 children participated. The age of the children was between 4 and 6 years. This experiment maintains two conditions. The first condition is money, which is expressed in three types of coins. The second condition is the neutral condition, which is expressed in three types of buttons. The children were asked to sort the coins or the buttons on mutual color. After they sorted the coins or the buttons, depending in which condition the children were, they've been brought to a different room. In that room, they met a new experimenter who gave them a puzzle. The children were asked to finish the task, but they also been told that they could stop at any time. Now let's take a look at the results. Did priming the children with money or a neutral object, in this case the button, affect the persistency of the children? Children who were primed with money worked longer than the children who sorted buttons. 12% of the children in the money condition worked until the maximum time limit. None of the children in the neutral condition did. So how about the performance? Among the children that were primed with money, 21.9% correctly completed the puzzle. In contrast, only 2.8% of the children in the neutral condition did. The findings of this experiment supported the prediction that market mode behavior is provoked by money even in children. Let's take a look at the second experiment. Does money priming improve persistency even when a task is unsolvable? This experiment is a replication of the first experiment, but this time with two improvements. The first one is that the puzzle now is unsolvable. The second one is that we're also measuring the mood of the children. In this experiment, 90 children participated. The age of the children were four and five years old. Again, this experiment has two conditions. The first condition is the money condition. It's expressed in coins again, in three types of different colors. The neutral condition is expressed in paper circles, which also is in three different colors. The circles are the same size as the coins. The children were randomly assigned to one condition. They all get 30 pieces of coins or paper and they were asked to sort them in color. Next, children reported their mood by answering the question, please tell me how you feel now. Bad, so-so, or good? The children had been brought to another room where they met a new experimenter. The experimenter gave them a puzzle, but this time 
task was unsolvable for them to proceed because the puzzle was created for kids several years older than them. Now let's take a look at the results. Persistence. Again, we found that children exposed to money persisted longer than the children who sorted paper circles. Now what about the mood? Children's mood did not differ significantly, which is actually a good thing because now we know that the persistency of the children was not biased by their moods. So the conclusions that we can make out of the second experiment is at first, four to five years old who sorted money as opposed to papers put in extra effort on difficult tasks. Second, mood is ruled out as an explanation of the results. And last, these findings replicate experiment one. Now let's take a look at experiment three. The question we're looking at is, does money cues hinder communal behaviors? The prediction is that handling money opposed to other objects would reduce the children's helpfulness. The third experiment is split in two parts. The first part will test if children have knowledge about money, and the second part will test whether children would react differently with a higher or lower value of money. Experiment 3A maintains 192 children from four to six years. Again, there are two conditions. First, the money condition expressed in coins, and second, the neutral condition expressed in buttons. The children were randomly assigned into a condition and were asked to sort on color. The children moved to a next room and the experimenter asked them to bring them as many as red crayons they could find. The more red crayons they brought, the more helpful they would be. After four weeks, the children were given a knowledge test that pits the number of money pieces against their value. Now let's take a look at the results of experiment 3A. First, we take a look at helpfulness. Children who sorted money brought back fewer crayons, which means a lower level of helpfulness. And what about money knowledge? Only 6.2% of the children answered the test correctly. It means that children don't have a good knowledge of the value of money. And so money knowledge doesn't affect the condition on helpfulness. Let's move on to experience 3B, where 64 three years old participated. This experiment includes two conditions. First, the money condition expressed in coins and paper, and second, the neutral condition expressed in buttons and paper. After the sorting test, they would move to another room where they would be asked to bring as many as red crayons as they could. Now let's take a look at the results of experiment 3B. Helpfulness. Again, the children in the money condition did bring back less red crayons than the children in the neutral condition. And what about the value of money manipulation? Money of lower and higher value produces similar outcomes. So in summary, handling money as opposed to buttons or paper reduces helpfulness among children. We also find that market mode cues can hinder communal behavior and that the effect of priming money is not affected by the value of the money. Now let's discuss the last experiment. Experiment four is a replication of experiment three but it's extended in a work using measure of communal motivation. In this experiment, instead of the experimenter need their help, it was the other children who needed help. Kids were given the chance to donate stickers to other kids, which they typically cherish. 125 children participated, with an age range from three to six years old. This experiment has three conditions money condition, a candy condition, and a button condition. The children were randomly assigned to one of the conditions and asked to sort them on color, just like in the other experiments. 
After the sorting task, the children get to see a pay scale, and the experimenter would ask them how they feel at the moment. The children were moved to another room where they could pick out six Disney stickers. After choosing the stickers, the children were told they can give as many as stickers as they like to the other kids from their school who did not participate, or they could keep all the stickers. Let's take a look at the results. Children in a money condition donated less stickers than children in a candy condition, and also less stickers than the children in a button condition. The children could pick out up to six stickers. As we can see, the children in the money condition took more stickers than the children in the candy condition and in the butter condition. The analysis of extreme selfishness is based on children who didn't donate any of their stickers. Again, the children in the money condition have a higher percentage than the children in the candy or in the button condition. In conclusion, experiment 4 showed that children primed with money showed reduced communal behavior measured based on generosity. Now let's take a look at the general conclusion. What did we learn from this experiment? The major findings of the study is that 1. Money cues evokes market mode behavior on young children. And 2. Money cues hinder communal behavior. This experiment showed just how significant money is to our way of life. So much that it enabled kids to shift into market mode when they were exposed to it. And it also caused the kids to behave in ways inconsistent with communal mode. Why does money enable us to shift to such a mode? The theory suggests that when we behave communally, it requires little mental processing. In other words, we don't have to think about it too much. But when we switch to market, it requires more cognitive operation, which turns into greater consistency and behavior. This explains why the kids perform at a higher level. When it was time for the kids to share the stickers, the kids had shifted into market mode and had a harder time switching to communal mode. Our brains get excited when processing information at such high level, and it takes some time for our brain to cool down once we get that hit. What does that mean for consumer behavior? If done correctly, money can be used as a motivator as well as a teaching opportunity for kids. Children are very much aware that money is a symbol to obtain something. Say as a parent, giving your kids allowance to teach them the value of it. You can encourage kids to save money for something they really want. This teaching from young can prevent a child from falling into making original decisions about money and purchases.